Hey everyone, it's super exciting to be here. So um, as Francesca mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about reinforcement learning for healthcare. So where, where is this need coming from? So choosing treatments is hard, right? Uh, there are many problems in healthcare, but a fundamental one is how do we find the right treatment for the right person? And if you look across the academic sector, you see you know, treatment efficacies are often low, you look at medical error, and you look on social media forums, you have people posting, you know, how many meds do you have to try before you just give up, right? So it's really important that we try to find the right treatments um, and match them to the right people. And that's exactly what our lab focuses on. We're working on problems in the ICU, in depression, in HIV. And today, I want to tell you a bit about our work in HIV. So let's, let's jump into that. So HIV um, affects about 36 million people world, worldwide, uh, requires lifelong treatment with uh, antiretroviral drugs. And the tricky thing about HIV is that it, you develop resistance to the drug. So over time, you have to keep switching the drugs that you work on. And that means that we have to reason about the sequence of treatments that we're giving to these patients. So let's just illustrate that with like a cartoon. This is not real, but just kind of what, what, why you might have to think about the sequence of your treatments. So let's say you have a, a patient um, and they have a, um, a, a viral load that you've decided is too high for them to have currently. Um, and so you give the, a drug, it works for a little bit of time, um, then you uh, start getting resistant to the drug, the viral load starts going up, you start a different drug, it goes down, now it starts going back up again. Um, you try drug C, but unfortunately that drug doesn't seem to work because uh, drug B also made you resistant to drug C. So once you re got resistant to drug B, you also get resistant to drug C. You try drug D and same problem, and now you're in trouble, right? Um, in contrast, if you happen to know that you know, drug B is great, but it causes resistance to many other drugs, or once you become resistant to drug B, you will become resistant to many other drugs, you might try a different strategy um, that reorders the drugs. Um, and also, maybe you'll settle for a, a slightly different viral load that's still below some threshold, but is acceptable, right? And this is, this is why you need to think about long-term in, in HIV treatment, again, just as a cartoon. Um, to get us to the core part of the problem. And to, to unpack that a little bit more, um, the key points are that we need to think about the future, right? Um, that which drugs you're giving now cause resistance mutations that might not only make that current drug not work anymore, but might make future drugs not work. So, right, we need to think about the future. But we also need to be thinking about the past. And what I mean by that is if I look at this point right here and this point right here, this is a cartoon, they don't look any different, right? The viral load is kind of the same. Yet, if I look in the past from this point, I know that these drugs have already been tried. And if I looked at the past from this point, these drugs have already been tried, right? So the, the history is different, even though the immediate set of numbers, the vitals, um, and, and biomarkers are looking exactly the same. And humans are not great at remembering things about the past and also reasoning about lots of events in the future, right? So this is where the notion of the digital doctor comes in for our work in reinforcement learning, because using tools from machine learning, we're able to think about all of the past, find summaries of the past, and also think about what might be going on in the future. So what I want to do today is, before going into HIV specifically, just unpack like what reinforcement learning does and then tell you um, how it relates to this work that we're doing in HIV. So the what, uh, what reinforcement learning does is it gives us a way of formalizing the problem that we are uh, dealing with in this previous slide. Right. So we imagine that our data is a series of actions um, that we're taking. It might be meds being given. It might be measurements that are being taken. Uh, we get observations. So these are measurements, uh, the, the results of the measurements. Um, and we have some intermediate reward signal that tells us you know, how we're doing so far. And maybe we get a positive value when the patient gets well. And our goal in this context is to maximize the sum of these long-term rewards. Right, so now we've taken a problem that started out as a clinical problem, which was, um, you know, treat someone with HIV, um, and turned it into math, right? This is the kind of general strategy um, in reinforcement learning. Now, let's try to, um, using this framework, 
think about that notion of the past, right? So I mentioned that one thing that is tricky is that you have to remember things about the past. So if I draw kind of the dependencies in this time series, it looks like a giant hairball because uh, you know drugs that you give now um, may have long-term effects into the future, not just at the immediate time step. And so this is, this is where it gets tricky. And so what we do in reinforcement learning is we add, we kind of just force in there some, uh, something that we call a representation or a state. So we're going to remember the history somehow. Right? And this is the key thing that um, our machines are really good at, trying to figure out what we need to remember about the past so that we can reason about the future. So if I'm sitting now at this time step, um, to reason about the future, I just need to remember this bit right here. Right? And, and this graph looks a lot cleaner than this hairball. Right? Now the dependencies have been broken up. And you know, it, it's kind of mathematical and you know, lots of pieces going all over the place. But if you think about it, you know, if you have something like a post-it note, you know, you, I, I survive on, on post-it notes and checklists these days. Right? Everything about the past is forgotten. I, I forget like, all the promises I made unless I've written it down somewhere. Right? And, and that's what this, uh, this model is doing right here. It's just remembering everything so that I can continue um, and not have to remember everything about the past. So once we set up this model, we can just work on solving it. So we have uh, now zooming out a little bit. You know, we have our model of how the world works. We know where we are right now because we have our post-it note. Um, our world sends us like observations and reward signals. And based on all of the stuff that we happen to know, we choose an action. So while it's grounded back into the case of managing HIV, um, what, what might this look like? This might look like, well, I, I've learned a lot of stuff in school about HIV, and maybe I've seen some stuff treating patients. Um, and here are some things that I've already seen about my specific patient, right? And I put those two pieces of knowledge together, things I know about the disease and things I know about the patient um, right now, um, and put them together to choose my actions. So uh, a reasonable question is like, so, you know, how, like does it work, right? Um, and there's been a fair amount of research that uses this general strategy. Um, and um, some of it on, in simulation, some of it with real data, and none of it has quite hit the state of the art, right? You know, it, it sounds very reasonable, but it hasn't really worked. And, and, and why is that? Well, the way I'm going to illustrate that is with the, the following um, illustration. Um, so if you're Dorothy and you see a twister coming, do you pull out your textbooks on meteorology, or do you just, you know, get out of there? Um, and the thing is, if you've seen a lot of twisters before, you don't need to go through and like calculate wind speeds and velocities and all this and realize that the best course of action is to leave. Um, you know that you have to go, right? Um, even though this thing might be a hugely complicated thing, you know, based on your experience, what you got to do, right? And, and so the drawback of the model-based approach is that it's kind of basing every, all of its decisions based on its kind of textbook knowledge, right? It's built up a model, maybe based on data, right? That's what we usually do these days. But it's still overly simplified for the situation at hand, because there's no way that we can model everything about HIV in the way that we can't model everything about you know, twisters. So what's the alternative? Well, the, the alternative that was the state of the art for a long time and kind of matches what clinicians do in practice is to say, well, um, if, if this is my current patient over here, um, let me find patients that look similar to that patient. And then I'm going to look at all the treatments that were tried for them and see what works best for that person, uh, for similar people. So here, um, you know, I, I have like HIV cell colored green, um, and uh, I find the other ones that look similar. And, and notice that, I mean, the, the cell is super complicated. I'm not trying to model anything about how, you know, the meds interact with the HIV virus, uh, you know, the virus uh, interact with anything else. I'm just saying that, you know, these, these guys look kind of similar based on some metric that I've come up with. And uh, it seems like in this case, like the blue pill seems to be doing better. Those patients, you know, did better overall, and, and the red pill didn't work so well. And notice if you had a different strain over here, the, the trend is the opposite. So without modeling everything about the disease, I just find people that are similar to me and, and, and go with the treatment that worked well for them. All right. So this is a very natural approach. And again, it kind of matches like, OK, I've just done this a bunch of times, and I'm starting to get some experience about what makes sense, right? I've seen this sort of case before. I can't tell you exactly why it's similar, but I've seen it before, and that's why I'm going to go with it. 
So, you know, this also has um, some drawbacks. You know, when you find yourself not in Kansas anymore, you know, maybe, maybe you wish that you brought some books with you uh, to understand what was going on, right? And so the key insight that we had is that these two ideas have um, complementary strengths, right? Sometimes you can rely on intuition or kind of your experience and what you see around you. Um, and sometimes you need models. And the models are too simple, but if you don't have experience, that's the best you can do. All right. <clears throat> so now let's apply that to the specific problem um, uh, in HIV. Um, so the first thing we do is we build a model. So we have different drugs. Um, we introduce that state, like I mentioned before. So that's just like a memory of what's been going on in the past, of what we need to remember. Um, and then we're modeling different mutations, um, CD4s, viral loads. This is all coming from the E-resist cohort um, and the Swiss HIV cohort, where they're not only keeping track of things like CD4s and viral loads, um, but they're also keeping track of what mutations the virus is accruing over time. So we can actually see those resistant mutations coming up. Um, and then we have this complicated reward signal. Um, I honestly have no idea what it really means. Um, but, well, I mean, I, I know like viral load and mutations, but you know, this comes from our collaborators and maybe this also highlights you know, the need to go back and forth with your collaborators and come up with something that does reasonable things. Uh, and also the fact that, um, you know, yes, it does reasonable things, but um, this is clearly just like a model, right? Like it, it's, it, you know, the world doesn't actually work this way. You're not getting like this many cookies every time you, you take an action or something like that. But, you know, it's the best we can do. All right. Um, I don't know what happened there, but is there a way to turn that off? Yeah, cool. Um, and so the other approach, which is I'm going to call neighborhood-based or kernel-based approaches, is to find things that are similar to you, right? Uh, and so there was work done um, now about five years ago that used this approach and did very well. And what they would do is say, okay, here's your history. Let's find patients that are similar to you, just like I drew in that other picture. Um, and in particular, let's look for people whose viral load dropped um, and stayed low for three weeks. And if it stayed low for three weeks, then you're doing well in terms of treatment. And you can change. So one thing about this is that the previous approach you know, was modeling the sum. Uh, we were trying to optimize the sum of these long-term rewards. right? Um, in this approach over here, we're only looking in the short term. And why is that? Or why did they only look in the short term? Well, when you take an action based on similar, you know, it, there's one action that you did, right? There's an intervention that you did right now, and it has an immediate effect, right? Now, if I looked at, you know, did these patients do well overall in the future, which we did do. We, we, in, the, um, in a few slides, I'll show you um, that we extend this um, particular criterion to say, you know, did they, did they keep their viral load down for a long period of time? What goes wrong is that there's many actions, right, that were responsible for keeping that viral load down over, say, a period of five years. And right now, you're only trying to uh, check for one action up here. So this approach is most appropriate when this, this problem is kind of well matched. But you can kind of hack it, right, and say that, well, the patients who are on a good treatment strategy started off by taking this action, and therefore we're going to start off by taking this action too. Right. But just keeping in mind that there's a number of things that could have happened between this action and five years from now that it could have affected the long-term result. But in any case, that's the, the alternative. And let's put them together, right? Now, in cartoon, um, if you happen to be lucky, what we're going to do is we're going to go with um, something that involves your neighbors. So if you're lucky and have some clones in your data set, Right? And they all tried different drugs. This is like the best possible scenario for you. Um, we're just going to go with what worked best. Um, but if you are unlucky and you don't have any clones around you, then we fall back on the model. Right? And so this is a, like a really simple principle, but a really valuable one. And what it's saying is that when you don't know what's going on, it's better to go back to some basic principles that are probably too simple rather than like match this person to like some neighbor that's far away, right? Rather than say, well, there's nobody like me in the data set, but there's this person who's really far away from me, and it worked for them, so it probably will work for me too. Right? And so that's it, right? That was a really simple core idea um, that we apply um, to this problem. 
<coughs> so when we, and then, uh, so how do we actually combine, uh, combine them? So the kernel or the neighborhood based approach um, you know, gives us an output, and as I said, we can either look at immediately does the viral load go down, or you know, does the viral load stay down over a long period of time. Um, we can have the model produce an output of an action that it prefers, right? So this is basically intuition versus textbook producing their guesses of what's the right thing to do. Um, and then based on the patient's statistics, right, about like how close they are and things like this, we decide on what the actual action is. And all of this stuff um, is trained end to end um, using automatic differentiation and all these kind of modern frameworks, which allows this thing to happen, wasn't possible a couple of years ago. So th does this work? Um, and it works pretty well. So again, we use this EU Resist database, um, about 33,000 patients. Um, this is um, rewards on a held out set of 3,000 patients. Um, and so we're looking at, at things like CD4s, viral loads, and mutations. Uh, we trim down the action space. So instead of looking at, uh, there are about 1,000 different drug combinations. We trimmed it down to uh, 312 ones that have been relatively common in our database. Um, and these 312 co drug combinations come from about uh, 20 drugs. So what do we see? So first of all, we see that doing random actions does pretty terribly. And I'm going to get back to what this thing is in, the, in a few minutes, um, uh, but based on our long-term reward estimate. Using neighbors, right, does pretty well. And, and recall I was saying that this was state-of-the-art for a while, right, that the model-based approaches, which is the next line, just we're not doing anything close because HIV is complicated, right? In simulation, you can do great. Um, but when you start applying it to real data, you do pretty poorly. But then you look at this policy mixture, right? So this is our approach, where we're putting together information from both of these approaches. And you see it does quite a bit better than the neighbor policy. Um, and the mixture is choosing the POMDP between 20 and 30% of the time, depending on the test split, which is pretty cool, right? Uh, actually, when my, my student, Sonali Parbo, um, my collaborator, when she was working on this, was really disappointed. She was like, oh, like this model is rarely being used. It's only like 20% of the time or 30% of the time. And I was like, that's two or three in 10 people, right? That's a significant number of people who are potentially getting better decisions because we're using this better approach, right? So it might be, uh, you know, uh, it's not a majority of the time, but it's definitely significant. And also, we go through and we can analyze, like, does it make sense, right? I think that's always a really important thing to do when you're working on these healthcare problems. Um, so you see here is the history length, um, and you also see the distance to the second quantile of your neighbors, right? Like, how, the, think of this as how far away your neighbors are. And you're seeing that the POMDP is being chosen, the model is being chosen, when the histories are long and the distances are far, which kind of, again, matches our intuition. We didn't train it this way, um, but this is what came out after we trained it, and it kind of matches our intuition that this is roughly doing the right thing. Since then, um, we've had cl expert clinicians in HIV um, pour over a few hundred of our policies and also just verify that they make sense, right? And so that's kind of uh, work that's in preparation right now. Cool. <laughs> so the thing that we're kind of currently doing with this is do going one step further. So one thing that this approach does is it helps to give you an action, but clinicians often want to know what will be the result of the action. Right? You want to kind of have a sense of like, okay, if I try this route, you know, my trajectory might look like this. If I try this other route, my trajectory might look like something else. Right? Um, and we want to be able to do that. So the way we're doing that is we're putting in the, this idea of neighbors inside the model. So now we have a model, and it has to figure out, okay, from this time step, what is the patient going to look like at the next time step after taking this set of drugs? And so we take this, uh, we take this time step, and we say, have we seen something that looks like this in the past? And if we have, right, if we have some clones, then guess the next step based on the clones, right? Like if we've seen this history before up to this time step. But if we haven't really seen anything that looks like this history before, fall back on the model, right? So it's subtly different because now we're combining our neighbors and our model at a modeling level, right? This is still within the model rather than kind of at the decision level. And what this allows us to do is, so here's, um, here's time uh, running forward. So here's, we're trying to make predictions about the future. So this hasn't happened yet. And we look at what actually happened based on us trying to make predictions at this point in time. So here's black, 
And now we're able to guess what this trajectory might look like um, at time step one, right? So again, at time step one, we try to guess what the next five time, time steps are going to look like. And what we see is that when we combine our approaches, we can closely follow you know, what the actual thing looks like because we're able to make better guesses, whereas the other approaches in green and blue kind of hop around a lot more, right? And, and we're, we're interpolating between them. We're combining the two of them. And quantitatively, you know, this is just one, one example. Um, so quantitatively, what we see is that the kernels do pretty well in terms of predicting what might happen to you one or two steps into the future. But as you try to predict further and further into the future, which starts to get more fuzzy, right? And you probably need to switch to a model. We end up doing better. Uh, we dominate for predictions further into the future. Right? And if you put this into um, the original framework of just like evaluating how well the policies do, we find that you know, in interpolating at the model level allows us to get even better policies. Right? So this is super cool, and this is a work in progress. <clears throat> but once we've gotten to this point, uh, a natural question for me was like, you know, where else can we use this, right? HIV is one place, but this notion is quite obvious, right? Or quite, you know, natural. You know, let's combine, you know, our kind of book learning with our experience to try to make the best decisions possible, right? So the place that we tried to apply this uh, was sepsis management in the ICU. So let's look at this problem. Um, and me, as a methods person, I look at HIV, and I'm like, oh, it looks like a trajectory of some number um, with some drugs. And then I change this word right here to blood pressure, and I carefully note on the last slide, it was just drug A and B, right? So it looks just the same, right? So clearly, <laughs> all we have to do to uh, you know, manage sepsis is, uh, you know, it's clearly the same problem as the HIV problem, and, and we can solve it with the same techniques. Well, not quite. Um, the thing is, with HIV, um, we were interested in kind of the integral of like how well our viral loads are managed over a long time, right? With something like sepsis management in the ICU, the real thing, it, or one of the main uh, things that we care about is did the patient make it in the end, right? Not whether their blood pressure was at a certain level at the intermediate point during their trajectory. And you could argue that actually we care about their longer term life outcomes as well. But you know, at least, um, you know, certainly we can all agree that you know, whether their blood pressure was out of range at a particular point in time is not the most important thing. Right. And so if we care about mortality, which happens kind of at the end of a, treat, uh, of end of a treatment um, sequence, that's much harder to evaluate. So what I'm going to do in the last couple of minutes of this talk is go through what makes it challenging. Um, and, and hopefully shed some insights about what sort of problems in healthcare, uh, sequential problems in healthcare are really amenable to the sorts of methods and reinforcement learning, and which ones are going to just require a bit more work. I'm not going to say not amenable, but ones that require a bit more thinking about how we're going to solve them. <clears throat> so in terms of challenges that come up, you know, why was the sepsis problem hard? Um, and by the way, uh, a lot of credit in this work goes to um, my PhD student, Omer Gottesman, and also uh, the CS282 reinforcement learning in healthcare course, uh, where many of these problems were unearthed. Nothing like a group of like 20 students trying to solve these problems, um, trying to you know, figure out every possible thing that doesn't work about the, uh, when you're trying to do something. So anyway, um, what are the challenges? Well, one major challenge is that in HIV, the main thing we're looking at is the drug cocktail, right? That was like kind of the, the main action that we're looking at. In the ICU, there's a ton of things going on, and they're not necessarily entirely coordinated. So, you know, sepsis um, is infection and response to infection. So there's a part of sepsis treatment and management that has to do with treating the infection itself. Um, there's also part of just the management that has to do with keeping the person alive, and that's where the blood pressure comes in. And because there's a lot of different pieces and different people focusing on the different pieces, um, we ended up with the, the initial question of like, how do we manage the blood pressure, right? Which is maybe this set of drugs over here just for cartoon and not this other set of treatments going on over here. And, and why does that matter, right? Like you could say, well, fairly, um, you know, okay, let the pathologist deal with this thing and then let me, you know, like some blood pressure expert deal with the blood pressure thing. It seems reasonable. The problem from a statistical perspective, though, 
is that when you only have a hammer, right, when you can only try to control blood pressure, you can end up with your AI saying, well, um, I have never seen a patient um, you know, survive in this sort of situation. Um, you better put lots, give them lots of vasopressors, or you better, or you know, more extremely, like you better intubate them, because you have a very low set of actions that you're choosing between, and that you're ignoring your other choices, and you're also ignoring the fact that sometimes you're in a situation where nothing will work, right? And the AI doesn't know that, so if it sees something that hasn't been done before, or it sees an ill patient. Um, at, with an action that has not been tried before for that sort of person, they're just going to say, let's try any action that we have available, whether or not it makes sense. So that's something that can go wrong. We can correct for that, right? We can say, let's only take actions that you know, are reasonable, right? Actions that clinicians have taken in the past. But that has trickiness, too. So now I want to go into you know, how you know, I had this, like, you know, weighted doubly robust or weighted DR met metric, right, up on the slides from my previous HIV work. Um, what is it actually? So I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through and explain exactly what it is, but I can give you a general sense of how these methods work. Because remember, in neither case are we going into ICUs or into HIV clinics and actually telling clinicians to do things. We had a test data set that we're evaluating on, right? And I didn't really tell you how do we evaluate on a test data set where the actions have already been taken. Well, the way that it, we do this, um, it, it, you know, again, in cartoon or in broad picture, is I look around this room, okay, you're in my test data set, and I'm like, okay, all of you in that corner over here, um, you did the things that I would have recommended, yeah, and none of the rest of you did. So when I take the average, when I take, like, you know, how well am I doing, instead of averaging over all of you in the whole room, I'm going to just average everyone in the upper corner. Right. So that's the basic idea. You find people that are similar to the actions that you would have predicted in your test data set, and you go based on that. So obviously, this makes your data set smaller, right? Because now I'm taking an average not of everyone here, but only the people in that particular corner. And so <clears throat> that's what, and that causes us to have higher variance. So let's see that actually happen. So over here, um, we have the variance in what we think the policy, the value of the policy for different policies. So if I look at, if I want to just evaluate the physician's policy, that's pretty easy, right? Because I can average everyone in the whole room, because that's what the physician's policy was. If I look at other policies, they may not match very often with people that I have in my test data set, and hence these error bars are fairly large. And what you see here, is that um, you know, something like a random policy um, might have error bars that look just as big or bigger than these other policies, and it's very hard to tell which is better. <clears throat> as I said, this mostly comes from the, the fact that we're subsetting a very small group of people um, who had the same sequence of actions that you recommended. Again, remember that the action sequence is long, right? So every hour, every couple of hours, you're making decisions about this patient. So it's going to be hard to find people who exactly match the entire treatment plan that you would have recommended. So if you look at the size of the data set, this is in log scale. So if we have thousands of people in our data set, if we look at the physician's policy made deterministic, we get to hundreds of people that we're averaging over. And if we look at the optimal policy by our model, we are at 10-ish people, <laughs> right? And this is way too small, and this is where the large error bars come from. So we don't know if our policy, you know, we're not, this is not saying that our policy is bad. We're, this is saying that we just can't tell, right? And evaluation is really important. So, okay, you know, you know, forget all that fancy statistics. Let's do something super simple. Let's look at, um, you know, here is the drug, here's the dose, uh, let's look at the difference between the dose that I would have suggested and the dose that the clinician did. And if the difference is large and the mortality goes up, then I'm just going to argue that my decision, my recommendations were good, right? Because this is basically saying that whatever my decision matches the clinician's decision, hey, the patient's made it more often. Right? That also seems very reasonable. And this form of plot has been used in a lot of different papers, kind of because it's just reasonable, right? It's a, it's a way to do an evaluation that says, you know, if I match on an action, um, you know, is the mortality rate lower? So this looks good, right? It looks like it's kind of a little ad hoc, right? There's less statistics behind it. 
But at least it, it suggests, right? Like maybe if we can't do the proper statistics, it, you know, there's like a suggestive trend here. Well, again, it turns out not really. So here now I've overlaid um, in green a random policy, which has the exact same form, very similar form, um, and also a no action policy, just like do nothing, never treat the patient. Um, and that look also ha that can only have a difference in one direction because kind of zero, you can't if you're at zero dose you can't in, you know have a negative of that, but it looks the same over here, right? And I don't have time to go into exactly why this happens um, because it's a little bit subtle. But again, the, but the core idea is that over here is where most of the data is. You know, usually the recommendations are often matching, and kind of out here there's not a lot of data. And lots of, you know, it probably there's a lot of mortality anyway, right, um, uh, for, for things that are quite extreme, in, in more extreme scenarios. So all of these points are pointing out, like, you know, there's a lot of promise um, for applying reinforcement learning in healthcare scenarios, but we've got to be careful. And so I want to wrap up with a couple of key points there. Um, there the biggest thing that uh, AIs, I think, are useful for in these sorts of settings are that they help us summarize histories and think about long-term effects. Both of things are hard for people to do, right? Especially with our very large electronic health record systems, it's kind of unwieldy. There's lots, you know, how do you find the right piece of information about the patient? Whereas a computer can consume all of that information. And computers are also good at thinking about statistics for long-term effects, right? And so they can quantify things with respect to the data that they have. Um, and again, this is something that's harder for people to do. Um, but at the same time, they're very much limited to what's in the data set. And this is why I think it's important for us to think of AIs as team members, or doctor AIs as team members, uh, with certain, certain flaws and also certain strengths, right? And I'm pretty confident that you know, we can integrate these tools into workflows um, where we can help, it, but that, that integration is going to involve like teaching clinicians about how these tools work and where they might break, um, and there's a lot of human factors that's also involved. And then, um, uh, as I was mentioning in the, the second half of my talk, the really key point is that we have to evaluate carefully, right? We have to know whether these things are working or when we don't know, right? And it's fair to say we don't know and we need to collect some additional data. That's totally fine. Um, but we need to be really careful, right? Because the consequences are pretty extreme if we do some shoddy science or shoddy statistics um, and start making drug recommendations without any real basis, right? So I have two quotes that I really like um, for these, these sort of situations. For the people in this room, um, by the way, I didn't ask, so how many people here are on the computational side? And how many people here on the clinical side? A few, yeah? Awesome. So for the people on the computational side especially, um, we're used to being kind of the cowboys of like just putting together lots of tools and things like this. Um, and I, I like to mention that with great power comes great responsibility. Right? That, you know, our clinical colleagues don't, are not always in the place to notice that these evaluations are going wrong in various subtle ways. Um, it's kind of on us to identify um, you know, these sorts of things and be careful with how we do them. Um, on the flip side, though, I, I always want to also mention that perfect is the enemy of the good, right? So if we don't do anything, if we're like, hey, this is too hard, right? <laughs> um, then we're missing out on a lot of opportunity in terms of summarizing um, histories and providing the inform key information to clinicians to make better decisions, right? So there's a middle ground, right? We've got to be responsible, but we've also got to be realistic. Um, and when we have something that works better than what we got now, maybe it's worth adopting. Last thing that I want to mention before I take questions, um, so if you're interested in more work along these lines, right, at the cutting edge of machine learning applied for healthcare, um, ML for hc.org, Machine Learning for Healthcare, it's a conference um, that I co-organize uh, where we have both clinicians and computational people coming um, and talking about the biggest advances in machine learning applied to healthcare, and I encourage you to check it out. Thank you. <laughs>
Hi. Um, I was wondering how uh, how influenced are these models by bias in the underlying data that's introduced by uh, the clinicians' behaviors? Um, what I'm thinking of are things like often in the clinic, um, we don't observe all patients equally. So it's not like a weather station where we're just taking measurements every 15 minutes no matter what. Um, a great example is in infection control. If a patient has been found to have MRSA positive, you have to don these like special gowns and whatever. And it's well known that that causes these patients to be visited less frequently. And therefore, there are fewer data points that are observed on them. Um, and if you, for some reason, have a VIP um, patient, you might observe them more often, and uh, the frequency of observation of the data points could influence uh, the actions that are taken and also skew uh, the actual collection of data. And how do these models account for that? So, so the, this is absolutely the case that um, this data is very skewed by all sorts of decision making. Um, so you describe some. Um, it, you can you also have lots of just site effects that if you have people across if you have your data across primary care and hospital and, and just the decision making strategies are different. The, the modeling approaches um, can deal with some of the differences in temporality by saying that you know, the disease was still progressing over some time period, and you, you are, end up making the core assumption that the disease process, the dynamics of the disease process is the same for someone who is observed at different intervals. Their progression may be different because they got, somebody got more treatments and somebody got less treatments, but kind of the dynamics of it doesn't change. You know? And I think it's really important to be um, explicit about those core assumptions because then you might come back to me and say, actually, I don't think that's reasonable as an assumption. And then we'd have to rework the model. And this is what the, a way in which the models are somewhat brittle to all of these assumptions that you make. And many times you can, again, find workarounds, but it's a really good question and something we should think about. Uh, so I like the concept of using the nearest neighbor when it is appropriate, meaning that it's actually close. Mm -hmm. um, could you um, talk a little bit about how you choose the metric or the topology you use at right. two-dimensional? Plot that right, was very right. Nice. So that was a cart the two-dimensional plot was obviously yeah, yeah, cartoon. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so here we also rely on our experts for how to choose these metrics appropriately. So the one for HIV is very tuned. It has it for the drug similarities. It takes into account the compounds and how they're made. Um, for the mutations, it takes into account which mutations are kind of in similar parts of the genome. Um, and I'm not expert in any of this, but it was put together by our colleagues. And what I find in practice is that. Um, our clinical colleagues are very good at giving us the terms that should go into our similarity metric, and then we optimize the coefficients associated with those terms uh, with machine learning techniques. Hi. Um, in terms of operationalizing some of this, uh, how would you envision that happening with the with uh, putting together intuition and then model driven approach? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's many many layers in terms of how do you operationalize. I'll talk about just the one base, the most, the, the closest to the data and the modeling, um, and not about kind of the layers of you know how how do you get hospitals to adopt things. Um, but what I think here, what's really nice is that there is an intuitive explanation for a decision, especially with the, the work that we're currently doing where we give the future trajectory prediction. So we can say that we're giving this prediction or this recommendation because of you know, these similar patients. And then a clinician can look at those similar patients and then and kind of do the sanity check and say, oh, okay, this makes sense to me that these patients are similar to the person that I have right here, and this looks good. Um, or we could say that we're making this recommendation based on these factors, you know, like the you know CD4s are here and the viral loads are here, um, and that's also a form in which we can provide an explanation. And again, the clinician has to do the final check of whether it makes sense or not. Uh, but the nice thing is that both of these models are amenable to some form of summarization that you can present. To a, to a clinician. Well, please join me to thank Finale one more time. Thank you, Finale. <laughs> <laughs>